you're privileged to be watching a pair of the world's most advanced feet. Not entirely bionic, maybe we'll work on that one day, but a very remarkable pair of feet all the same. Homed with unerring accuracy onto a series of targets by a guidance system almost devilish in its cunning. An outstanding feat, you might say, of high technology. The feat of your local postman. By a curious quirk of postal terminology, a postman's round is known always as a walk. Curious because he may actually ride his walk on a bike. In country districts, where the distances are longer, he may drive it in a van. Who knows? One day, he may fly it in a helicopter. But still it remains, traditionally, a walk. What's changing today, though, and very dramatically, too, is the sorting system that guides the letters that control that walk. In the past, with around 1,200 sorting offices all over Britain, handling posted letters. Every letter has had to pass through as many as a dozen pairs of hands in three, four, or even more different places. There's postmarking and sorting at the office of origin. Then further sorting en route, sometimes in traveling post offices. More often, in a succession of sorting centers, splitting the mass into progressively smaller areas, and then sorting yet again at the destination town. A skilled job, this. Its final stages always having to be done by people who know every step of every postman's walk. Because you're dealing here in a strictly one-at-a-time kind of individuality. While your average transport and distribution concern sorts and moves its goods in bulk consignments to a limited number of addresses, often on a simple weekly run, the Postal Service must treat every single letter to any one of around 22 million addresses as a consignment in its own right. And if it's first class, what's more, it's wanted tomorrow. So with all these hands at work, it's little wonder that a good three quarters of postal costs are labor costs. The first steps to find down the sorting process were taken, in fact, as long ago as 1857, when the first postcodes were introduced in London. These were nothing more ambitious than compass points, but at least they told the sorters roughly which way a letter should be heading, and in their time, they helped save money. 60 years later, during the First World War, we started adding district numbers to the postcodes as well, to define areas a little more precisely. There were grumbles about this newfangled nonsense. London's London, isn't it, damn it? But London and our other cities were getting steadily bigger, and so was the volume of mail being poured into them. In 1857, the old GPO had handled 500 million items of mail a year. In 1917, when they added numerals to the codes, the total had risen to 3,500 million. Today, the annual postal load has topped a towering 10,000 million. So what does any modern business do to meet a rocketing public demand like this? It turns to machines. For it's a commercial fact of life, machinery is the only way for any busy enterprise to maintain its service and contain its costs. In consultation with the unions, the post office is streamlining the 1,200 sorting offices that handle posted letters down to some 80 modern centers, each equipped with devices that can sort more than 260 letters a minute, around eight times as fast as the fastest hand sorting process. Yet even the cleverest hardware, stands to reason, needs programming to tell it what to do. And that's the purpose of today's postcodes. To cover these 22 million addresses in the British mainland and Northern Ireland, the country has been divided up into 120 postcode areas, each one identified by one or two initials, such as EH for Edinburgh, NR for Norwich, CF for Cardiff, ST for Stoke-on-Trent, L for Liverpool. Let's take an example. A letter posted in Liverpool addressed to Technolux Engineering, 154 Kingsbridge Road, Portsmouth, PO3 5XA. Cracking the code is simple. The first two letters, PO, stand for Portsmouth and its surrounding area. Every area is then subdivided into numbered districts. 
in the case of Portsmouth, from PO1 to PO41. This letter is addressed to PO3. So that 3 homes it in on the correct district. District PO3, in its turn, is subdivided into numbered sectors. Our letter is coded for Sector 5. Now a bird's eye view of Sector 5 shows the final stages of subdivision into streets and parts of streets. XH, XB, XD, XA. And since our letter ends its code with the letters XA, these finally pinpoint its target to an accuracy often measured in mere metres. For each of Britain's one and a half million postcodes covers an average of only 15 addresses. Many big commercial customers, in fact, have a code entirely to themselves. So it's as simple as that. PO for the whole Portsmouth area, three for the district in it, five for the sector of that district, and XA for the street, part of a street, or commercial building to which our letter is finally homed. Postal modernization is a fact of life. It's here for good. But exactly how good is bound to depend on a combined effort. The post office has the machinery. The customer has only to supply the postcode to make it work. So let's watch it at work. A firm in Liverpool posts a letter to a firm in Portsmouth. The letter comes in, along with a few hundred thousand travelling companions, at the Liverpool sorting office. One of those 80 machine offices that are changing the face of the postal system. What they call a peg coding device lies in wait to trip each bag into a pre-selected funnel, so distributing the mail between a series of discharge points. The letters and packets are then emptied into the segregator, which separates one from t'other by a principle of beautiful simplicity. The steel flaps lining the drum are hinged, opening just enough to let letters slip through, but not the bigger or thicker packets. These carry on out of the end of the drum for separate sorting. Falling through the flaps, the envelopes go through two more grading stages, diverting over width and over length ones, so as to arrive at a stack of the post office preferred sizes, POP for short. The advantage being that the machines from this stage on are designed exclusively to handle them. And the first of those machines is the automatic letter facer, ALF to its friends. The letters come to ALF facing every which way. ALF scanners locate the stamp on each one and activate twist-over devices. These turn the envelopes right way up or front to back, positioning the stamp every time in the same corner. Another scanner then casts an eye over each envelope and notes whether it's stamped for first or second class. Then the machine diverts the mail into first and second class streams, cancels their stamps and drops them into first and second class stacks. Anything that puzzles Alf for any reason goes into a separate tray for separate treatment. Then the first stage of sorting can begin. And it's here at the coding desks that the customer's contribution, the postcode, starts to be important. As the letters pass in parade at each desk, an operator punches their codes on a keyboard. Electronic impulses from the keyboards feed into a computer-like gadget, and an instant later, two lines of phosphorescent dots are impressed on the envelope itself. The bottom line here represents the PO3 part of the code, district number three of the Portsmouth area. The top line represents the 5XA, the local delivery sorting instructions that will take the letter accurately to its target. These dots from now on become the key to mechanised sorting, the programme that makes it all work. For here, in the pre-sorting machines, scanners now read from the bottom line of dots the town each letter is bound for, and so stream it into one of a number of sorting plans, each plan covering a fairly broad area of the country. Then, each stream of pre-sorted mail comes to an automatic sorting machine. 
this is set to the appropriate plan for that stream. And then, still by reading the bottom line of dots, it sorts the letters of more than 260 a minute into 144 separate boxes. And remembering that these machines can be set to a choice of different sorting plans, that equips them to sort for many hundreds of destinations all told. Now, as our Portsmouth letter arrives in the Portsmouth box, it's labelled and bagged for its journey to the Portsmouth machine office. Here at Liverpool, the mail starts its journey in automated ease. A continual underground flow from the sorting office, through a tunnel, straight to the trains in Lime Street Station. As many of these new offices as possible are being sighted cheek by jowl with the railways. But even where this can't be done, the economy of the machine system, both in transport and in labour costs, is obvious. Stands to reason, the postal service will burn up far fewer transport miles in bulk deliveries between the 80 new centres than ever it did in its scattered journeys between the 1200 hand sorting offices. A good many other countries have introduced codes and mechanised their mails, of course. But most of them are limited to the first stage operation we just saw, sorting outgoing post into its destination towns. Now, though, more and more of them are considering extending their systems to match the British method, because this, mostly designed and developed within the post office itself, can adapt at the turn of a knob from outward to inward sorting, right down to individual postman's walks. For the walk, of course, remains the logical, sharp end of the whole system. All the postman has to do now is put his letters in the order that fits his route. 26 Acacia Avenue before 28. The butchers and bakers before the candlestick makers. And Technolux Engineering before Snodgrass Electronics. Letters without postcodes, of course, miss out on all the high-speed technology, going into a limbo sort of box in the machine, and then being sorted by hand in the traditional way, taking up time and effort, slowing down their handling and perhaps their delivery. Of course, technological revolution can take a while. A modern letter office, like ancient Rome, isn't something you build in a day. The full complement of 80, in fact, is scheduled for completion in the mid-1980s or even earlier if it can be done. Don't be fooled though, the fact that there may not be one in your area yet by no means makes your postcode a waste of time. For one thing, existing machine offices are often used for preliminary sorting of mail en route. A letter sent from Walsall to Eastbourne, for instance, may well be speeded electronically on its way by the machinery at Red Hill, but only, of course, if the postcode's on it. Besides, there's surely a lot to be said even for cultivating tomorrow's postcode habit today. After all, there are an awful lot of people in an awful lot of businesses who have yet to be educated to it. OK. Four dozen Mark Threes, KT5s. Got it. You will let us have an order. Yes, it's 154 Kingsbridge Road, Portsmouth. What? Oh, I don't know the code. No, we never use them. We'll get the cheque tomorrow. Invoice number F for Freddy, 3212G, for George. Well, you've got our address. Oh, very well. Um, it's Crawley House, Aldwych, WC2. The code? Oh, uh, we never use codes. Uh, you've got our phone number, haven't you? 8364992. Most people today happily accept a mass of numbers and letters uh, as a normal part of their daily work. Assembly E S. Double three, six, five, oh. And the address? So it's strange, really, how some of them regard the postcode as some kind of weird bureaucratic whim. Oh, never mind that, but your postman knows where to find you. His postman probably does. But the whole countrywide sorting organisation that gives him the letters for his walk most certainly doesn't. 
postal mechanisation is here for good, simply because it's the only possible way for the post office, like any other big commercial outfit, to cope with a staggering volume of business while maintaining service and containing prices. And all this modernization depends totally on that vital data, the customer's postcode, to give it life and purpose and the means to speed the mails. P-O-3-5-X-A. W-C-2-B-4-Y-P. P-E-1-4-Q-Z. The orders, the deliveries, the payments that keep industry and commerce alive. These are what the modern postal system is about. How many companies can afford in these days of tough competition, of sticky cash flow, of high interest rates, to leave out those simple letters and digits that could make the difference, for example, between a cheque tomorrow and a cheque today? Many firms are finding other valuable uses too for postcodes, including matching their own sales area boundaries and internal references to them. Take Portsmouth again as an example. The area sales manager in charge of Portsmouth and its surroundings could use the code PO. Each district supervisor, under him or her, could use the district code PO1, PO3 or whatever. While each sales rep under them could be coded by sectors PO1, 5, PO3, 5 and so on. This reference system can extend to individual premises too. Simply by adding a few characters from the address, a unique code identifying that one address can, if required, pinpoint a single customer. The advantages are obvious. Since the postal boundaries were worked out in the first place to suit the population density, as well as the postal, road and rail distribution system, they're equally ideal for the creation of distribution areas from a company's own depots. Some customers never quote their references because they can never remember them. This too can be made easier by basing every reference on a known postcode. Add to that many more applications. The planning and measurement of survey statistics, the organised preparation of market analyses by area, the accurate aiming and assessment of direct mail campaigns, the most economic vehicle route scheduling. And you've got a nationwide reference system to help speed just about every kind of business communication. But the principal point and purpose of the postcode system still remains the speeding of the mails. And thousands of companies, by using their postcodes on everything they print, are showing they've got the message. The postcode is the vital factor that helps them with rapid reaction to sales inquiries, quick delivery of estimates, orders, consignments, payments, all the lifeblood essentials that make up the very heartbeat of British business. These feet were made for walking, and no amount of modernization, thank goodness, will ever replace the time-honored postman's walk, his daily contact with his customers. Yet, as we said, they're also a pair of the most technologically advanced feet ever known. For they're guided on target by a backup control of quite extraordinary precision. And it's a combined control. The customer supplies the postcode, Post office machinery does the rest.